Welcome to the Cashflow Project Podcast. Are you looking to better your financial situation by increasing your cash flow? Too busy to hunt for real estate deals or don't know where to start? Then you're in the right spot. Join us as we dive in and talk about investing for cash flow using multifamily real estate. Welcome to the Cashflow Project. I'm your host, Vince Gethings with Tri City Equity Group. And today on the show, we have Chad Tucker. Chad Tucker is from Central Florida, married, four kids, full time firefighter, and a full time real estate investor, as it happens. So, uh, Chad, welcome to the show. Thanks, Vince. Thanks for having me on, man. It's, it's good to talk to you on this format. Awesome. Yep. This is going to be great. Um, I know Chad from our community, uh, the, the Real World Profits community. So he wanted to grace us with his presence, talk shop a little bit. And it's going to be a fun episode about, you know, I know we talked about um, before, before we started recording here about some mindset stuff about being, you know, what team roles to be in, being full-time W2, full-time investor, kind of what that, what that's like, but um, let's get into it. So tell us a bit about yourself. Uh, born and raised in Florida, started out in a little small town in the Panhandle and uh, moved down to central Florida for a job with the fire department. Uh, kind of like everyone else, I got a blue collar job. I've got four walls, my family's fed and I'm very comfortable in my life, but something just didn't seem right. Uh, a couple of years ago, I turned down a promotion with the fire department just because it just, it wasn't the right move for me personally. I, I just, something didn't feel right. And, and through that, I went back towards something that had drawn me in years ago through wholesale real estate. And I was like, I'm going to do duplexes or I'm going to do single family. I'm going to fix it. They're, they're, like anyone else, there's tons of ways to go with this. That I was like, just none of it made sense to where I felt it was right until I met multifamily. And I talked to people in multifamily and the community welcomed everyone in. It wasn't like a cutthroat business. It's like everyone's working together to help everyone succeed. And I was like, this is, this is where I need to be. This is, this is my industry. So planted my little flag about a year, year and a half ago into the multifamily world and dug in like everyone else, bigger pockets, podcast, this podcast, that watch and everything to, to just learn what I could to be a professional multifamily investor. Nice. So what, what drew you to multifamily over all those other avenues? Like you said, there's a you know thousand ways to skin the cat in real estate, which is, is awesome. But why, why multifamily? Uh, when I did wholesale in the past, it was great, but it, it something just didn't seem right. And I went back to doing firefighting after a couple of bad deals I got screwed over in. And I was like, okay, well, what, what made that not work for me? And I never saw it as a business. It was just, I'm going to make a money here, make a money there. Same way with fix and flips. It was just that. And I was like, okay, well, if I do duplexes, I've got a little bit of money. Not that like I, I'm, I'm, I can't pay stuff, but like, I don't have a lot. So how do I leverage? And I was like, okay, this is going to take forever in the multifamily or the single family or the Burr method. Not that it can't be done. It can be done. And people are doing it amazing in that industry. But for where I saw it, I was like, okay, let me, let me look at multifamily. And then I saw syndication and JV and with people and, and bringing value to people. And they, they're willing to pay for that value. Uh, in a deal, why don't you produce good returns for them? And I was like, oh, I can do all this. Like I can make stuff efficient. I can, I can be very good with people under pressure and and have a deal structure kind of go together and put the right people in the right seat. And all of that just really fit my personality. And then the long-term equity growth was the play for me. Nice. So you saw that, you know, the wholesaling route was too transactional, kind of, that's what it sounded like. The the small multi, small multifamily duplex stuff just there wasn't, you know, it wasn't really life changing, you know, money we're talking yeah. about here. And, and then, you know, you got to uh, the multifamily and, and, you know, not to be cliche, but it's definitely a team sport where the the table is much bigger with multifamily. Um, so yeah, you're getting a slice of a pie, but it's a much bigger pie when you're doing multifamily than, uh, you know, say a duplex or a fourplex or a single family or something like that. Yeah, exactly, man. I mean, I think what I tell a lot of people, and, and and I obviously haven't been in the industry forever and a half, like some people that I talk to, but one thing that really stuck to me was like, what is my end goal? My end goal was more time with my family. Uh, and what fits my personality? So like my personality, I've always worked in a team environment at Firehouse, you, you in the military as well. I'm, it's, it's a team environment. So that kind of drew me into multifamily too. But then the time with my family, I was like, man, if I'm 
fixing pipes and doing this and, and doing all the maintenance stuff, or if I'm rehabbing all these houses myself, or if every day I'm out hustling, walking the streets, calling sellers for, you know, one deal to make a couple grand on the flip, it it's great, but it's taken me away from my family. Long-term multifamily has the scalability to put other people VAs in place. Love it there. So, you know, you said something there about beginning with an end in mind, or at least you said something that sounded like that, begin with yeah. an end in mind. So definitely one of my favorite quotes from, from Stephen Covey. Um, so how did, how did that, you know, kind of mindset shift go when you're, when you're sitting down and reflecting, okay, where's the end goal I want to be? And, you know, what's the most efficient route to get there or best route to get there, effective route to get there? Like what, what was that kind of conversation with yourself, I guess, when you're going through that? It's, it's, it's a daily conversation, man. I, I'm sure now, I mean, how long you been out of your W2? Um, officially like 30 days, but in, in reality, <laughs> it's been like eight months. So. It, so it's just weird to me to think that because like I said, I, I, I make very good money and it took a, and, and very good in the sense that, you know, I'm, I may make 75,000 this year as a firefighter which compared to a lot of people, I understand I'm very well off and to some, I'm just someone, but to the common person, I'm not that in my world, that's a lot of money. So I had to get my head changed around. It's okay to want more, you know, than that. And then to want more for my family. Yeah. So that, that, that mindset took a while and some other stuff that I had to go through and process what money meant to me growing up because I, I didn't grow up with a lot of money, but I didn't grow up, you know, starving either. But the ability to say it's okay to want more was something I had to process and say, okay, you can, you can go after more and it's okay to, to, to want to add value to other people and get rewarded for it. And then once I made that mindset shift, I was like, okay, so what's that number? And I was like, the, at the end of the day, I had numbers in mind, but what's evolved over the last year is I really don't have a number. What I would really like is what I call time freedom. And when I explain that to people, like what I'm working for, is I want to wake up today in the morning and go, I can work today. I can take today off and go hang out with some friends. I can go see my parents. I can go on vacation. Like whatever I want to do with that day, I can do. And that and that's eventually where I want to get. Nice. And you're going to get there really soon. So I love that beginning with the end of mind. You have a strong goal, which is the time freedom, uh, which is very important. I think that's what everybody... Um, is ultimately after, but they just throw a number at it uh, to get there. And, and, you know, I said this on the, another show previously um, or recently, which was like, people always put a number at, you know, to what their goal is. I'm like the, the whatever, $10,000, $20,000 a month, that's not what you want. Like that's the tool you're going to use to get what you want. I and mean, what you want is, you know, time freedom or, or a lifestyle or to travel. Like that's what you want. You want to share experiences, but you're, you know, your family or your kids and stuff like that. Um, how you're going to get there is having that much cash flow come in. Um, so don't think about the money as the goal. The money is the, you know, the, the, the tool to make the goal happen. So that's awesome. You were able to have that kind of mindset shift. Those are really big. Most people don't go through or go through their entire life, uh, in yeah. realizing, uh, be, without realizing that. Um, so awesome stuff. Well, good. So you had your mindset shift. Wanted to get in. You chose multifamily as the route you're going to go. So have you done any deals yet? We, I am set to close on my first like deal that I found and acquired. <laughs> hopefully by Wednesday. Now it was Monday, so hopefully by Wednesday we're close. But I mean, honestly, I, I I can't complain. It's been a lot of work this last year building up relationships and stuff. But literally a couple of phone calls and the team was assembled and people had whatever I needed in place. So it, now we're just waiting on the lender and the title company. So we have 16 units right outside of uh, Gainesville, Florida, a little section in the North end of the town that we're going to, we're going to take the tenants and, and continue on with the current owners done. Nice. Do you know who um, Rodney Mullen is? No, I haven't heard that name. Oh man. He's a really famous skateboarder. Uh, he's from Gainesville or that's the only way I know Gainesville exists. Um, it's because Rodney Mullen, my childhood hero, is from Gainesville, Florida. Um, anyway, so 16, <laughs> completely random, but uh, 
anyway. I'll have to go so, stalk him for you when I go up there to look at our property next time. Yeah, he's probably like gonna sixty now, but um, <laughs> with a with a half bike in the backyard still. Yeah, I, I, he probably is. But uh, anyway, back on track. So sixteen unit. How would you find it? Uh, this one, I mean, it's through a broker locally. Uh, he puts out a lot of content and value, but the, the, the benefit to me is this is one of the first brokers I ever talked to over a year ago. And it's a broker that has been very open and candid about how to build relationships, how to be a professional in this industry. If you want to be known as a professional buyer. And I mean, I went best and final on several of his deals and, you know, I got disheartened some of it, but you know, he, he always kept let me see deals and kept letting me come to the table and, and knew I was serious. So when I landed this way in one town, it was, it was very serendipitous that my first deal was with one of the first brokers I ever called. Nice. So I showed you, you know, we had that net report and kind of that reputation that you're building up it took a year to land that first deal. And a lot of people don't have that kind of patience, um, persistence to, to stick around for a whole year with one person keep engaging them uh, and keep showing up to tours, keep putting in offers um, to land your first deal over a year later. So uh, yeah, it shows you what, what it takes just to get one deal. Right. Um, yeah. yeah. I mean, there, there's, there's other people you're doing it with. This broker does a lot of data stuff too. And, and 90%, 93, I want to say of all deals in the state of Florida on the North half, not including Orlando and Tampa that he pulled were sold to a broker. So mm-hmm. like, I want the time freedom. I could go direct to seller and there's nothing wrong with that, but the majority of the deals are going through brokers. So I've focused my energy this last year and I've developed very good relationships with a handful of good brokers. And I'm still trying to grow those relationships with other brokers that, you know, they don't have a deal sit in their pocket for me, but when I get to the closing table or get to the, the final bid table with someone else, at least they know me other than someone who's bringing an offer. They know me as Chad with a wife, four kids, a fire truck. I know where they went to college. We talked about their flip that they're doing on the side. You know what I mean? So like, it's a relationship game. This whole industry. Is. Yep, absolutely. Um, so one of the things that, you know, you mentioned most, this guy's data driven and most of the deals are going through brokers. Uh, one of the tips that I got um, that could help you out. And I don't know, remember who mentioned this. It was one of the meetups um, or conferences we were at, but He was like, I value my time so much, the the speaker here, um, that even if I find an off-market deal that I like, like a property I drive by and and whatever, I'm driving for dollars. He was like, I don't spend the time to go and reach out to that person and and do all that stuff. He's like, I'll send the picture and the address to my broker and then say, get this guy on the phone. I want to buy his property. And then they can, and I was like, at first, I was like, why would you do that? Why would you cut a broker in and you know, and all this stuff? You're gonna end up paying more. And he's like, My time is worth more than that. And he's like, I don't have the time to, you know, drive down, you know, this this person that owns this property and and you know, skip trace them and set up the set of meetings and try to butter them up over, you know, six months a year, convince them to sell and all this stuff. And he's like, I, the, that's the broker's job. He's my job is to, you know, close properties and execute business plans. So He's like, I see, I see a property I like. I get the address, take a picture of it, send in my broker, and say, find out who owns this and convince them to sell to me. And I was like, wow, you're the. I've never heard of that from anybody ever. Like that strategy um, of like intentionally giving properties to a broker and saying, I've you know, done it. Yeah, that, that, that's awesome strategy. Maybe it was you that. Uh, no, no, no. <laughs> I, I, I've done it. Like they say no, or we're not interested. And I just give it to, because I mean, I've called my broker and I was like, hey, I got this thing and. My buddy, he's like, which one? I was like, I'm not going to tell you. He's like, which one? How big is it? I told him in the city. He goes, well, it's one of these three. He goes, it's this one, isn't it? It's so-and-so. He goes, I talked to her on May 13th. He pulled up his CRM, told me everything about it, told me more than she told me about it. And I was like, he's like, I got a follow-up call with her here in another three weeks. And I was like, that's, that's what they get paid to do. And, yeah. and they do very good. I think what happens in this industry, and it happens in every job, period, is people don't stay in their lane. If you stay in yeah. your lane and you do your job really well, you'll grow really quick. I've noticed. Yeah, it's the people who try and do a little bit of everything to save a penny, and and not bring other people in to 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 bring value. You're going to end up doing everyone's job. Yep, exactly. And that and that's what it, I had a that gave me. We're talking, you know, uh, mind shifts here. That one conversation, that one piece of advice from that I think it was like a, a operator panel or something like that. 
at, at a conference and I was like, wow, that's, I've never heard anybody explain it like that. Like that's huge. And so now I, I do that now, like I'll drive by a place and, or I'm in a town that, you know, I, I I'm, I'm not the expert in, I'll write down some addresses and I'd send them to the broker and be like, Hey, find out who owns this and tell them that, you know, get some numbers and tell them they got a buyer. If, you know, you can put it together and it might be six months for them to close that deal. But that's six months that I'm not, you know, burning the oil and trying to butter up this person and, you know, wine and dining them and everything like that to convince them to sell. And I can, you know, if you said stay in my lane and just execute uh, my business plan, my portfolio. So um, good strategies. Yeah, man. I mean, I think that's one thing that you have to look at mathematically. How do you multiply your efforts? And, and for me, I make X amount per hour. That's what I've done for the last 18 years. Well, I've done it before that when I was a kid and, and waited tables and stuff like that. I made X per hour. And I thought that's my work. And it, it, it right now it's my worth and what I do for the fire department. But what I do outside the fire department is worth so much more. And when it gets to the point that I'm losing so much money at the fire department, then I have to have the hard conversation of leaving the fire department. But for right now, it's it's not there. But, but you know, maybe by next year it is or the year after. And people have asked me, are you going to leave without your pension? I was like, why would you shoot yourself in the foot from growth to to just get a pension that it's great, but it's it's not the end all be all. Yep. It, it, same, same conversation. So I did 15 years active duty just November 20th was my ETS and, um, or my DOS, uh, now. And I was at 14 years and like 11 and a half months. Right. So the conversations that I had when I was going through that process of getting out, they're like, you're an idiot. This is the stupidest thing you could do. Why don't you just suck it up and do one more, or, you know, one more tour, but, you know, get to 20, get that pension. I was an E seven. So making pretty good money. And I was like the opportunity cost for what I'm doing and where my company could grow over the next five years, that pension's not going to touch it. Um, so, yeah, I mean, it's weird because everyone that we've been around in our life and that, and, and, and there's nothing wrong with that mindset. It's just, we got open to other mindsets and, and maybe even your listeners listen to this. If you think you're worth X, you're worth X. Like if you think you're worth Y, you're worth Y. When I was doing uh, some work with another partner, I, th- I, I was doing the pay to play to get experience. And then it finally got to a point where it wasn't growing and I had to leave. And people were like, oh, why did you leave? I was like, I had to leave. They're like, you left a little, like you were getting at least some cash flow out of it. I was like, yeah, but I wasn't, there was no growth and I was worth more than what I was getting. And it was really uncomfortable conversation I had to have with myself that I'm worth more than this. Because if I, if I do X for X hour, I've sat in stone. That is what I'm worth. And, and it's not going to get me where I want. Love it. Love it. Great, great show on mindset here. Um, so let's get, <laughs> let's get back to that deal. So 16 unit about to close. Yeah. Hopefully it closes, you know, um, you say Monday or Tuesday soon, right? Nobody, we're, this is going to get aired in like months from now. So <laughs> from everybody that listens Monday, to this. Monday is December, what is that, 20, 20th? Yeah, something like that. Yeah. yeah, December 20th. So I'm going to be hanging notices on people's door, hoping that they don't get scared Christmas Eve or the day before Christmas Eve that we took over as new management. But I've got great managers and we've already drafted a beautiful email saying that we have no intention on making any changes for at least the first 30 days to 60 days. And yeah. we want to take care of them. So they have some ease. Love it. You know, one of the things, and we'll, I want to dive into this deal a little bit deeper, but one of the things that we always put in our letters is um, we do a top at, at the bottom of it. So it's like, you know, who we are, where to pay rent to on the first. And, um, you know, what are the top three maintenance concerns that you have with your your home? Uh, so that's kind of what our letter looks like. Uh, you know, warm introduction, pay rent here, you know, what's wrong with your place? And what that is, uh, you know, good for is one, you got to make sure they pay rent on <laughs> uh, to the right place. And <laughs> they know where. The old owner, right. And then and the, the maintenance, um, you know, those maintenance requests, those top, what are the top three things wrong with your, your home has been a secret sauce of mine um, during takeover uh, on mine, on my deals, because uh, two things. One, it will give you some deferred maintenance items that you probably missed during uh, due diligence, right? During inspection. So it's kind of like a frenzy. You're trying to get so much done in like a few hours, you're going to miss stuff. And the person that's not going to miss something is the person that's lived in this place with a leaky toilet for, you know, three years or, or whatever. Right. So, or like, 
you know, my stove burners aren't working or something like that. And that's yeah. the kind of stuff you're going to get. Right. So I always put in there where the top three things wrong. And then, so now I have a, a, my full, my full list of deferred maintenance for the interiors anyway, of this property. And, you know, 16 times three, you know, you get an idea of how much your deferred maintenance list. And then the second thing I do is I make it an absolute priority that that is uh, our maintenance techs. Number one job until they're done is completely track down and kill that, de- that newly developed deferred maintenance list. Um, and what that's going to do is it's going to give you early buy-in from your residents um, that shows, hey, these new people, they, they're, they're professional, responsive. they're responsive, they care about my quality of life. And you take care of those uh, three maintenance issues, those top three maintenance issues right away. You know, say I, I usually, you know, it's December 21. I would say by the, the deadline I would put on my maintenance team is by January 31st, all of these need to be gone unless, you know, circumstances like parts on order or whatever, they all need to be addressed. Tenant needs to be contacted and says we're working on it. The buy-in and, repu- um, and rapport that you're going to build with your residents, it, it's it's like uncalculable, um, if that's a word, uh, of how, how, how Today it's it is. So, yeah. So when you do that, now it's going to be, man, these, these people really care over the last, you know, slumlords or whatever we had, or mom and pops that kind of checked out 10 years ago. Um, so then when you the, come the on- asset management I did. Yeah. The yeah. So when you come on with those, uh, those rent increases, you know, maybe three, four, five, six months on the load or on renewals, they are going to have so much less resistance from that one thing, that lo- that one thing that you did with the, the letters, the way you introduce yourself and your company and the way you handle business those first 30 days. Um, you can slide in, you know, $100 rent bumps, no problem. We like it. My quality of life is has greatly improved since you guys been here. I want to stay $100, $150, whatever it is, uh, whatever market rent is or uh, what your strategy is. Um, so that would be my piece of advice for that. Um, Okay, so takeover on Monday. What kind of deal is this? The value add? What's the what's the give us the layout? So it's a it's a value add. But what I've found through the little bit of asset management I've done for another partner is, and honestly, the market cycle is I I like asset management and value add through operations. Like we're not going in and gut renovating down to the studs or doing huge remodels. That's that's not where I shine. I don't. I don't really want to deal with contractors every day. And it's not that they're bad. I just, it's a lot of work. And like I said, I want my time. But what we do is we try and go in and we find those people that are doing a good enough job, but maybe they don't know what their market rent is anymore. Maybe they don't have the systems and processes in place to run it efficient. Uh, the, the last deal that I helped take over and I was asset managing, the number one complaint, 2014 built townhomes on a lake, beautiful property, granite countertops and all. Number one complaint we had from the tenants. Can we pay online? I was like, <laughs> you will be you will be able to pay online day one. And they're like, thank God, because they were having to drive 15 minutes up the road and deposit a check with the property management company. I was like, no, nah, we can fix that today. Yep. Online, the online portals with the maintenance ticket or maintenance requests online, pay online, ACH, just auto draft it. Like I'll, you know, here you'll get a uh-huh. discount for auto draft. Um I like that. You know, stuff like that. Yeah, we we do it all. So what about um what what kind of property? So sixteen unit. What, what's what do they look like? Is it garden style, they're, they're, duplex they're, style? They're, this one's actually four quadplexes on okay. individual parcels, but they're all on the same street. So they're they they're all owned by the same guy. They're all on the same street. It dead ends into a huge city park, and just to the west of us on that parcel, they're building a five story, fifty five plus tower. So brand new construction it should be open next spring. So our goal is to basically reposition this property into a C asset that it is in a, in a B area or C plus area and to a C plus B asset by just doing cosmetic upgrades on the outside, putting system and processes in place. And then, and then cleaning up, we needs to be cleaned up on the inside. Some kitchens are going to have to get redone. Some floors are going to get done, some paint, some electrical stuff, but I mean, nothing, we're not, we're not going crazy on it. Are you doing, um, do they have wash dryer hookups in, inside? They have washer and dryer hookups already, already That's from cool. uh, build out. So, I mean, and everything's separate metered. So like it's, it's a clean management play for yeah. us. And that works out well for me because I'm two hours away. Uh, I've got a good property management team through atrium management, but uh, I, I like that they're separate metered. They're separate d- washer and dryers. Like they have, they don't have assigned parking. Like all the headache stuff is gone. And we're mm-hmm. just going to come in and provide a good, clean, safe, professionally managed home for these people to live in. Love it. Music for my ears. All right. So. 
what's the end goal of this property? Keep it, refi, sell it. What's the what's the plan? Oh, it, the goal was to syndicate this one to get my feet wet in the syndication because that's where I want to grow is in the syndication realm. Uh, through a year of contacts and relationships, I made a call and the and the gentleman that I called to to KP to sign on the loan for this one because I don't have the net worth. He just, he laughed and he goes, how much do you need down payment? And I told him, he's like, well, would you take partners and do a JV? And I was like, I, I'd rather not. I'd rather just, you know, build my momentum. And he came in with all of it through a 1031. And he had a 1031 closing with another partner. They're both good people. It, it just felt like a good mix. So they're coming in and, and we're closing this thing as a JV. Nice. So we were fully funded. One call. I love it. Love that. and that's a, the power back to the power of networking and and just getting out there and building relationships, um, you know, over a long period of time without expectations. I think that's a big you know big thing is like, you know, just building like real relationships with people in this industry, and you never know if it's going to come to anything or or when you're going to need to make that call. Um, but if you're honest about it and you, you try to provide more value than you're looking to take. Um, you know, that's it. It's it. You saw just one call and you got a deal fully funded. So love, love hearing those stories. Um, okay. Yeah. So, so JV, you didn't, you didn't check your syndication box. Um, not this week. We'll do it next, next week. Month. Next week. Yeah. Next week. Uh, so what about, um, uh, senior financing, senior debt? What would you get for bank? Uh, it's really weird because out of the 16 units, all except for two are on Moff to Moff, and they've been there for years, but no one wanted to touch it because they said it was unstable because they were month to month. Yeah. So we, I, I we literally just dealt point. with that. Yeah. I'll tell you a story like, here. How does that make sense? And they're like, well, because they could just leave any day. I was like, yeah. so could anyone with a toll month lease? <laughs> so yeah, that, well, we, welcome to welcome to the world of community of banks. So, I, I I will say this: your lender is your biggest investor. Like, there's yeah. people that bring money, but your lender is your biggest investor. So you need to underwrite and look towards your lender. I, luckily, I learned that early on, and, and we have bridge debt in place. A bridge is not a bad word. If you have a good business plan, you have a good system, you have good processes in place. Bridge is excellent to work in the environment I work in. You just have to execute, and uh, we're getting great rates from. Uh, you want me to say the name? Go ahead. Lima One is who we're using. Uh, they've been pretty decent to us, especially since I'm a, a newer investor. Like I, I don't feel like I'm getting shoved to the bottom of a pile, which could easily happen. Uh, they they've given us 5.5 rate, and we're going to have 25 year amortization with uh, two years interest only, like 18 months to so. We're going to refi this thing back into community, maybe even agency, and I'm going to return the bulk of the money back to every one of my investors. And we're going to continue on holding this thing for at least another five years. The goal is seven years total. We might go longer and refine the process again. What's the, um, so is it a bridge loan or a commercial? Yeah, loan? we're doing bridge. What's the commercial term? Bridge. Uh, 25 year with 5.5 interest and then two year. Two What's year the term? So, it's like when do you got to pay it off? Two years. Okay. Yeah, we have a one year extension that we can put on it, but we're the business plan is mathed out. It, so it's two years interest months, only with a two year term. Got it. So the, with the one AM year extension, not, the AM is relevant. Nope. I guess. Yeah, pretty okay, much. Gotcha. <laughs> that's, that's what I was trying to figure out is you threw me, threw me out there. Um, got it. So two year bridge, two year extension. So you got four years to solve this problem. Probably, you know, refinance at the around the two year mark gives you two year buffer. That's good. I like it. Yeah. Um, yeah, a lot of people know Lima One from like fix and flip loans, and and because they that they're really heavy. Like that division of Lima One has like a ton of marketing to that kind of crowd. And a lot of people don't realize that they are they're a full blown commercial lender. Um, it's kind of like you're saying too is you got to go to a broker, you got to go to someone who can get it done too. Because we knew we were going to put some renovation into this, so we wanted that finance too. So when we community bank didn't touch it, we went to someone that plays in that ball field. And we went to a broker or two as well, because we wanted to use their leverage. Yeah, no, absolutely. Yeah. The brokers, again, mortgage brokers, they have, they spent a lot of time building those, those kind of backdoor uh, relationships with a lot of these bigger, uh, bigger lenders to make sure that your, you know, your file gets heard rather than just going to like, you know, lima1.com and some, submitting an application, you know, where, where on the pile does that go and what kind of terms are you going to get versus a broker that, you know, closed 30 deals from them last month. Uh, for them last month, right? Um, yep, I love it. All right, so we got that. I got a mom and pop value add, 16 unit, Central Florida. You're gonna execute it's on a bridge loan. You're gonna refi it. 
Great. Sounds like great. What's the, so seven year term, what's the, um, like the IRR target of that deal? Like, what are you trying to at the seven year performa? So the seven year performa with the refi, cause I, I, I split it up to a JV version, but the original version we're hitting probably 20% IRR, but okay. how I do my underwriting is very conservative in the sense that I only raise rent for the first two years to market value. So whatever rent is today, I underwrite going to in two years. And then I do a 1% rent growth after that. So 1%, we, that is conservative. Yeah. I mean, I know I'm going to get more than that, but if yeah. the deal works like that, I'll go pull more triggers if I really like it to maybe add a little bit more. But if I can come up to market rent over two years, because it usually takes about 18 to 24 months to stabilize a property and bring up to rent, I know I'm going to be over that because market rent's going to go up in two years. And then at the same time, if I'm only doing 1% rent growth and we hold it for five years and we get 5% rent growth, which we've been on fire in Florida getting, I think parts of Orlando got 23% last year and Tampa got 20 something percent too. Like I'm not betting on that, but man, those are some sweet icing on the cake. And that's yeah. why you're seeing guys get out of their syndications early. They're hitting their targets within a year or two. Yeah. We we're we're getting ready to exit two of our five year um, deals and one at the two and a half year mark and one at like the 18 month mark. Um, almost well, why not refi and hold? Um, well, one's a JV in an area that I don't want to be in long term. It's like C class and a C class. <laughs> so it's like, you know, not not the, my vision of a legacy property, right? So yep. uh, that one, I just want to get out 1031 to something bigger and that, you know, nicer asset kind of trade up uh, quality. And the other one is a syndication. Um, and that one was, it was kind of our first indication. So a small deal, you know, we're getting our five-year price like in, in, at the 20 month mark. So that's good. It's like, Hey, let's just cut and run and um, pay all of our investors back. And now that, like I said, it was our first indication. So as a GP, we took, you know, very little because we, we didn't have like the credibility. So this was like our credibility property. Um, now it's going to make a great case study property. Um, yep. And we're going to pay all our investor back. And then now we have like a full, fully fledged company now. Um, and hopefully we do good by those investors and they come back and invest in our new project, which are going to be much bigger and nicer assets. So, um, but yeah. So I we're, think we're that's where people, people forget, like you're saying, you're going to take something that you had to, you didn't have to buy, but you bought at that point of your career because you guys were starting out to get your feet yeah. wet with maybe like a C minus asset. And, and yeah. there's nothing wrong with, as you grow, just cutting off, off the stuff that just you feel you want to do better next time. Yep, exactly. Yeah, we, we got in somewhere and that, that's what, where we could get our foothold in the market, built our entire company around those two prop, those two deals. Um, but now our, our focus and, and visions on, you know, B class and, you know, B markets uh, is where we want to churn our portfolio over to over the next yeah. couple of years. So it's all about the growth. I love it. Um, Great clarity. Love it. So what is the biggest obstacles you you faced uh, you know, on, on that deal or just building this company in general? I mean, honestly, I think the biggest thing for me was just getting my head wrapped around. I, I sat in a room with a gentleman who was going to buy a $10 million deal by himself. And, and we became friends and we still talk today. And I'm like, I don't even understand why you're talking to me because like we're on two separate, but they're just people. And to me, I saw like, it just had to come with a chef. Uh, there's a gentleman here locally. They have they have 800 units closing in, in the last two months of this year. Just him and his team. And I'm like, me and him go have coffee every now and again. And we just talk nonchalant. And he, you know, he gives me tons of advice. And I'm like, I, I don't even understand why you're doing this. Like, you're so busy and you're giving me an hour of your day. And he's like, nah, it's fine. I, I like to talk to you. <laughs> I was like, I, I, it, it, that mindset of changing and adding value to other and helping people has helped me so much more because it, this deal literally all came from a broker that I created a relationship with, with friends that I created a relationship with that are my partners on this deal with, you know, property management that I have good relationships that are my friends that like, literally I made a couple phone calls and everything's just fallen in place. And now I'm just waiting on the lenders and the title company to tell us when to sign some docs. Love it. Good stuff. Um, so what's next? What's on the horizon for Chad Tucker? 2022. Uh, so, I mean, it's like anything else is ever evolving. I'm hoping to, like Michael Blanc says, the law of the first deal. I'm hoping to leverage this deal. And, and, and you know, it shows me that, yes, it gives me that confirmation that I can do this. But it also, 
allows me to go to others and say, Hey, we, we've got these units. Let's get some more. And we, we, we've been competitive on a couple offers while we're under contract with this. And I'm hoping to get three to five deals next year. And I'm hoping one of the three to five, we're hoping to shoot for over a hundred units on that one, because I, I want to get into that ball field as well and, and just see where we go from there. I mean, we want to stick to our core mission of providing good, clean, safe, professionally managed properties. And we want to stay right here in central Florida doing that. Great, great market. Okay. Love it. Do you have a, uh, how many deals you, you want to do next year? Do you have a, a goal for that? Three to five. I mean, I'll, I'll do more. <laughs> but I, I honestly, it's really weird. Like uh, six months ago, I probably wouldn't have said this, but I honestly feel I have capacity to do more than three to five because I, I have the right people in place. Like I I'm seeing that now, like you, you, you build a good foundation and it just goes quick. But three to five is my goal. And one of the five, I would like to have over 100 units in that one. And, and that's going to be obviously a syndication. Obviously, uh, I won't be the, the head GP or anything, but I just want to start putting my feet into that. Arena. Nice. You don't have to say, obviously, you never know if you're, if you're going yeah, to be a head GP. I, right. I mean, it could. Well, the, you know, everything that this growth and this kind of mindset shift that you've had over the last you know two years or so, Kind of gave you some, like you mentioned earlier, your clarity. Um, if you were to go back to 20 year old Chad and what advice would you give him? I don't know. I, I, I would say you can do anything that you want to do. And that's anyone that's listened to this. If you want to do something, the only thing stopping you from doing it is you. You just have to be an adult and admit that you're getting it in your own way. You're giving yourself excuses. Oh, I can't do it because I got to work. Well, then work yeah. more or work or work less on other stuff like YouTube or, yeah. your, you know, whatever. Or else work smarter or work harder or both. Right? You got to do one of those yeah. two. You I know? mean, this last year, I, you know, I love TV like anyone else, but I've cut a lot of that out. I'm working 30, 40 hours a week in this. I'm working 56 hours a week in real estate. I, I'm still present in my child's life. I still go to events. We went camping the other weekend and it, it's a balance act. But what I've done is I've cut out a lot of that dead stuff that I was doing that just doesn't move the needle. And, 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 and that's the biggest thing is you got to give yourself the credit. Now, would the 20 year old me believe it? No, but maybe plant the seed then a little earlier. So maybe at 36, I, maybe I did it at 30. Yeah, I love it. Yeah, that's a, I got some some family members and stuff and and mentees that I'm I'm trying to give them like, you know, the Grant Cardone books and the the Robert Kiyosaki books, try to try to find, you know, who is the right person to give the message that I want to give. Because it's not, you know, it's not me. They're not going to listen to me. But I'm like, okay, I know enough people or enough that have written books. Like, who is the right person to deliver this message that's going to get through to them? And and I think finding that is, uh, you know, for people that you're mentoring, um, you know, you got all this great advice, but maybe you're not the right person to to give it to them. So finding that person to deliver that message, and I usually usually do like podcasts, audio books, or book, like my, for example, I got my nephew, and he's like 18 or something, just graduated high school, and you know, going through all that stuff. And, and, uh, I was like, who's the right person? I gave him a step for that. I don't think he cracked it open. I don't think I was okay. That, that was a mess. I was like, who's next? I'm like, David Goggins. Like <laughs> so I gave up. You know, I, I, I said, get him. Yeah. I sent him, you can't hurt me and, and audible. And, uh, I think that'll, that'll do the trick and, you know, light a fire. Um, so I think I mean, that's, it, you just got to be present too. There, there's people that they may not want to hear your message. It's kind of like we were talking about with some of the marketing stuff that you do in this industry. Like you don't know when it's going to hit someone. I was yeah. sitting lost, not knowing what to do over a year ago on a cruise ship with my wife. And we, we try and take one vacation a year, just us for our anniversary. And I'm reading a book that I don't even know how I bought it. It was called The Slight Edge. And I was like reading it and something in that book resonated with me that at that day in my life, I needed to shift from being a pension firefighter retirement. Like I, I wanted to do this full time. And it was just, I've read Rich Dad, Poor Dad. I've known this stuff. I know a lot about real estate because over the years I enjoy reading and learning it. But like that day on the top of the cruise ship, reading that book in that moment, like just, I'm doing this. That was it. Love it. Taking action, burning bridges, burning ships, yeah. not bridges, right? We build bridges, we burn the ships. I got that mixed fire up. Truck. Don't burn the fire truck. Somebody's going to need that one. Um, <laughs> no. Yeah, bur burning ships. That's yeah. Um, except not the cruise ship you were on. You don't want to do that either. Um, yeah. Let's just move on. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> we're, dig we're digging ourselves a hole. 
Yeah. Uh, so let's go over to the fire round. Damn, more fire stuff. Uh, more burning. Um, so the the <laughs> fire question. Round, yeah, the same uh, same questions we ask every guest. Um, just first thing that comes to mind. So, what is the best book you recommend other than Rich Dad Poor Dad or The Slight Edge? Oh, I can't do Slight Edge. You just you just All said right. it. Somebody already wrote it down. They're listening. They already jotted it down. So give them give them something else. Man, Atomic Habits is a good one. When, when you say that Atomic Habits is a good one that really hit me. Who, not how. Honestly, as you start growing, I, I met a guy. He fixes and flips in 16 different markets. He doesn't even know like who owns what. He just signs docs. And I was like, how do you do this? And he's like, oh, this guy does it. This guy. And I was like, I need to be like him if I'm going to scale. Mm-hmm. And, and that, that book really helped me change my perspective on stuff too. Who, not how. Love it. Great recommendation. Uh, what is your superpower? my superpower is I play nice with everyone. I mean, I don't have a choice in the fire service. I don't get a choice. Who's on my team uh, at the fire scene. I don't get a choice who's on the fire scene as far as my patients and everyone else that I'm very good under pressure of putting everyone in the right seat and kind of controlling the chaos. Love it. What is the biggest lesson you've learned over your career? You can do anything, man. It really, it's stupid as that, but like I've, I've been able to to be a part of people's lives in the weirdest moments with the fire service. I've pushed myself to so much limits. I've stayed awake several days in disaster zones, health and stuff. I've chiseled through huge concrete blocks. And, and now I'm buying a 16 unit, $1.6 million apartment complex with people that I know, like, and trust with not a lot of my own money in the deal. Love it. It's going to be a launch pad to your next deal. Like I said, but Michael Blanc's, Law the first deal, the next one's going to be a 32 unit. Next thing you know, you're yeah. going to be like Chad Tucker, real estate mogul, 2022. I think, I think I'll just still be simple. I mean, I, I don't think I'll have a Lambo yet. When Lambo, Chad, when Lambo. Um, <laughs> for the busy working professional who is working toward their financial freedom, what advice or tips do you have? You have to put systems and processes in place. And at the end of the day, like whatever you're doing, you have to figure out what are your KPIs, your key performance indicators, what's going to move the needle. I, I, I have this metaphor. I say to myself, I put a drop in the bucket every day. So every day I'm going to do something that moves my needle, puts a drop in my bucket. And hopefully one day that drop overflows my bucket. And that's a win. That's this deal. That's this deal. That's whatever. Uh, so you, you have to constantly take those daily actions and knowing what those are. My, mine are really simple. I need to call brokers. I need to underwrite and look at deals. I need to submit offers and I need to follow up and close offers. That's it. Like if I don't have enough deals going out, then I don't have enough deals coming in. If I don't have enough deals coming in, I need to call more brokers to, to get more deals coming in. And it's, it's that simple. Whenever I get busy, I don't have a website yet because I just haven't devoted the time. I don't have this and I know I need it, but I've devoted my time to those four things. Love it. You know, a good, a good book that I've read that was kind of one of those uh, monumental books for me is the one thing by um, is it Gary That's Keller and Jay Papson? Yeah, so that was that was the one where it's like I have my vision board over here and it just has like that little wheel, the wheel thing that he has. And it's like, what's the one thing that you can be doing um, that's going to you know achieve this goal, right? The eighty twenty rule um, and, and that. So I it's like you got you got kids. Everyone on this podcast three, yeah. listening, the, yeah. everyone on this podcast listening has kids. Maybe they have a job. Definitely. They have school. If they're not in a job, they have some kind of excuse that pulls you away. And there's days that honestly, like I come home and I, I don't have time for anything, but if that means I make one phone call, I order right. one deal. I, I, I underwrite that one deal at two in the morning because that's just when I can do it. Or I write the LOI at two in the morning because that's just when I can do it. Then that's what I do because I have to keep moving that needle. Yep, exactly. And, and to your point, it's like, you don't need to, like not every day needs to be a 20 hour day. Like, you know, if you just do a, after working and you can just write like one email to a broker, one reply to a broker, just to stay top of mind on them. Even if it's to tell them, sorry, this deal doesn't work. Here's my criteria. Please, you know, keep sending me and keep thinking about me. I appreciate the, you know, thinking of me on this deal. Even if it's that, even if it's like a, a completely, you know, bunk deal, still yeah. reply to them, still say, thanks for thinking about me. Keep sending more deals. Like that will, you know, keep your pipeline full. And it took 30 seconds to do that. And a tip for everyone listening. The minute you send them back, it is their deal. Someone is going to buy it. It does not fit your criteria, but someone is going to buy that. So don't go poo-poo their deal or talk shit yeah. about it because that's their job to sell it. It just doesn't work for me. 
Yep, but the exactly. last thing I say before I get off the phone is, what are you working on? Do you have something that I can look at? Because yep. a lot of times they take 30 days to get a deal onto the listing and out on their email blast that I might get a two-week head start because they're like, oh yeah, that one doesn't work for you. But I've got this other one that we just got under contract that we don't have the marketing package for. I was like, I don't need shiny pictures. I just need a T12 and a rent roll and an address. Exactly. Love it. Great tip. Still dropping you into the last minute of the show. Um, much appreciated. Do you have uh, any last words for our listeners? How can they get a hold of you? Things like that. Uh, you call me anytime you want on my cell phone. I'll try and answer as long as it's not two in the morning because I might try and get a few minutes of sleep. But uh, 850-206-4603. And my email is Tucker, T-U-C-K-E-R, holding, H-O-L-D-I-N-G at gmail.com. And you can find me on Facebook the, or LinkedIn. Yeah, say all the socials all and everything, stuff. right? Yeah, good Facebook stuff. Facebook and LinkedIn would be the easiest. Got it. Good stuff. Well, it's been an absolute pleasure hanging out with you the last hour here and look forward to you at the next meetup. I don't know. I think it's the next boot camp or mastermind or something. I'll be, I'll be down that way at St. Augustine or Jackson, uh, Jacksonville here soon. I'm sure. So yeah, great show. And thanks for, thanks for coming on. Thanks for having me on.